<laughs> he caught Lauren Travers' head and just gave it a big kiss and a lick. <laughs> and I swear, oh. I couldn't believe it. It was very, very funny. Well, Happy New Year and welcome back to the Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Ryan Wilson and Simon Zebo to discuss all the big stories from a very entertaining week of rugby. How are you guys? Missed you both. Oh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to see you both. Yeah, what a year it's been already, eh? <laughs> Great start. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, so what, did you, um, what did you guys get up to over Christmas and New Year? Go on, Zeebs. I'll let you go first because yours have been a lot more eventful than mine. Ah. Did, you make, did you make it home for Christmas? Yeah, Eve? yeah, I did. I did. I got home for a week. I got some time off, thankfully. Um, we had played like a crazy amount of rugby, you know, we, uh, leaving last season, going straight into the Champions Cup and then top 14 straight after. So everybody had to get a, a week off at some stage. And lucky enough, mine was... Uh, the Christmas break, so I got home for yeah around six or seven days, and um, had to do all the testing and stuff and isolating. But it was still nice. We got to 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 do the best we could with uh, the Christmas we had. So it was good. Yeah, it was good. I nice saw Finn was home. over this way as well. Is it the more important players that got time off over? <laughs> no, 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 no. Are we got sure? we the opposite. We had to go to Claremont then the week after in the freezing cold and the snow to to play that. So we weren't rewarded too much. Um, but uh, yeah, it was good. It was a nice little break. How did you get on? Yeah, we were right. We uh, quieter than normal for me for Christmas. It was a strange one. We got after playing Exeter, we had to self isolate. So pretty much ten days of self isolation right up to Christmas Day, which got me out of Christmas presents. Oh. I sent my eight year old daughter with my wife to uh, to the shop and supermarket to buy her presents. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing's changed there yeah. and then Christmas day was just well it was nice because it was just a family but like compared to last year my, my family I've got four sisters with like 14 kids between us all and so it's usually it was 27 people in the house last year well it wasn't in the house it was in a 40 quid marquee in her garden in the freezing cold so very different at my house to what I'm normally used to but like you said mate nice to get to spend time with the family eh? it's the first yeah. and last time we do it just us I think Mm. Christina super quiet but see I, we always have a very quiet Christmas and um, so I usually never leave the house between Christmas and New Year's so it kind of made no difference oh, but really? um yeah I, I'm very social in December at the start and then by the time Christmas Day comes around I'm like I don't want to see anyone else I don't want to go out on Stevenson's Day so um yeah very quiet was looking forward to getting back to doing this actually what's Stevenson Day Boxing Day oh Boxing Day right okay must be a nice thing <laughs> We have to talk about the French second division when, what is his name, Ryan? Because nobody would help me pronounce beforehand. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm an expert here. Watch me get absolutely called out. But Rasuge is, I think, his name. He's a Fijian, isn't he? Just like um, Okay, so Rasuge celebrated his side's victory at the final whistle by picking up the referee above his head like Mufasa in The Lion King. <laughs> like, what did you make of this? Like, Ryan, I'm going to ask you, actually, were you particularly jealous that he thought of this before you? Oh, hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. And you can see him, like, this is so for Jean, and he's, like, bouncing around behind, like, waiting for the ref to make the call. Come on, make the call, make the call. And he's just got so excited, carried away with it and picked the ref up. I thought it was hilarious. What killed me was how the other team were like saying, oh, give him a card, give him a red card. Like, he can't it's be a disgrace, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, you, you like, even if you're on the opposition, you burst out laughing at You're like, you've just yeah. lost the game. I know it's bad, but you're cracking up at that. And then the ref almost walks off, doesn't he? And he's getting so much abuse that he's like, right, I better give him a red. He's obviously clipped the foot. Can't let him get away with that. Mm. And then it's the comments after you get people going, oh, it's a disgrace. We can't let this into rugby. It's going to turn to football. Where in football do you see people picking up the referee? Do you know what I mean? It's madness. So I absolutely loved it. And like knowing the Fijians that I know, it's exactly like something along what they do. I can see Nico Matawali doing exactly the same sort of thing, you know? Um, so I absolutely loved it. It's like, did you see some of the comments Zeebs around it? Like some people questioning it and saying, oh, it's not right. We shouldn't. I know it's not. It's probably not right. But what do you think? I know, yeah, but I, I think you you just take it for what it is. Like, he was just so overwhelmed by the happiness of the result. He was bouncing around, as you said, 
Um, but that's their nature, you know. They're just happy-go-lucky people, the Fijians in general. I don't think there's an ounce of malice intended in what he did, you know. And, um, like, you see them in the sevens tournament, you know, when they run out as a squad and they'd, like, lift up the ball boy and stuff yeah. like that, you know, to, like, give him his moment, you know. I think it was kind of something along those lines where he was just so happy with the ref. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wouldn't have the strength to do it, but it was hilarious. The ref didn't know what was going on. Oh, uh, but I, I, yeah. I'm all for that, you know, obviously in once off occasion, but yeah, you can't be punishing uh, his happiness. Yeah, you've like, I, I understand. Yeah, you, you can't let it go, probably. So, yeah, what he's done is probably right, the ref. But, um, yeah, you get some of the comments around it, you're like, oh, give it a break with everything going on at the moment. Yeah, a little bit of fun and laughter from that. That's quite funny, but yeah. Who were they playing? I don't know who they were playing, but yeah, nah, me neither. Start moaning yeah. about it. I, I just, I loved it. <laughs> I was waiting for Nigel to come out and tweet something about it, like because you would have seen, he would have thought it was funny. He would have got yeah, annoyed. But, at even first, all the, the top tier it. rest, all the, all those boys, like were were loving it and laughing it. I don't think not one of them said, "Oh, this is an absolute disgrace." You know, just look at the look on his face. He's like a child. How happy he is! Like so, there's plenty of fellas giving referees proper abuse in games, as we we'll probably come to later, but. Yeah. Something like this, you know, it's the 2020 crew now, the PC crew coming out trying to attack him. Like, but, Absolutely. Um, nah, it's only, it's only a bit of fun. And hopefully, I, well I, done saw, just, um, uh, I saw our own Jamie Roberts, actually, he called out, was it, um, was it Wayne Barnes and Nigel Owens to get their opinion on it? And yeah. it was uh, Wayne Barnes's wife actually retweeted and said, if anybody does this to my husband, I'll give you 20 quid in a game. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty class. Jamie was probably moaning about it, wasn't he? He was yeah, probably saying it was wrong. <laughs> never have happened. This is a disgrace. He was the one. Yeah, yeah. Now, it was a week where the refs actually dominated the news, as we also had Liam Williams and Carl Sinclair getting into trouble for swearing at and back chatting the refs. Ryan, do you think that this problem has kind of gotten worse over the years? Um, and what would you maybe put it down to? Yeah, oh, it probably has got worse, I think. Um, I, the problem is like with all the microphone and stuff like you can hear so much more so it's probably more um noticeable on the pitch but yeah, you do hear it a little bit more i guess with well, these situations are different as well i'm pretty sure though i, I read something where carl sinclair had played with him they've been teammates former teammates so the problem sometimes is they know each other too well and and it gets on players nerves you know like these derby matches seems Mm. where the coach is from the home nation. So it's a guy that you've done international stuff and they've come in and refed something in camp and guys, you know, they've, they've usually been through the, the rugby union somehow. So the IRFU um, refs have come through um, previous players and stuff like that. So players know them a little bit better. Um, I, don't, I still don't think there's any place for it. But yeah, I think it has got worse. And like one thing you do not want happening is it getting anything like football. Like that's one thing I, I do respect is like how you speak to the ref, how, how you, um, you know, deal with him. I, I mean, I took my son up to football up here in Glasgow. And honestly, I saw these eight, 10 year olds running around playing football and the way they're speaking to each other, speaking to the ref. And you just think it is a disgrace how they speak to the ref in football. And you don't want that coming anywhere near rugby. No way at all. So um, probably something that needs stamped out. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I just don't think there's any real need for it. You know, I, I'm sure he, as you said, he probably knows them real well and stuff. But, um, you know, like if there's anything so serious or so bad that's on for you, there's so many cameras nowadays. It's going to come up, like you know, and it's not going to be so blatant that he'll miss it. So I think there's a level of respect there that you you need to have. Um, but these are things you're taught from a young age, you know, you're taught respect and discipline. And these are things that rugby ingrains in you. The only thing that differs the older you get is the ego gets a little bit bigger. So you feel like, oh, you know, I can say these things like I'd be I wouldn't be for that at all. Like I, I um, like and I'm sure it was just a split second where he just lost control. And it's different when you're in the heat of the battle, but it's not a good look for rugby. Um, and the same with Liam Williams the other day what he said when he was leaving the pitch like uh, it's it's a red card like you know there's no two ways about it the, the way he went into the rook and he's another really nice guy really like him as a player as well like I couldn't say a bad word about him but it's just not a good look for the game so hopefully they, they learn their lesson and uh, they change it but um, 
yeah, those those early values that you get ingrained in you from from a kid playing rugby, like respect, discipline, all these things. And everybody makes mistakes, but you know, this is something you definitely can't let go any further. So to discuss this further, we're joined by the legendary JP Doyle to give us an insight from a referee's point of view. So thank you so much for joining us today, JP. No worries, Christina. Thanks for having me on. Well, firstly, I suppose I would love to just get your reaction to the incredible scenes that we saw in France at the weekend. Um, like, what would you have done <laughs> if you were lifted in a game? <laughs> well, I thought if I thought, well, what if that happened to me? What if Joe Takori lifted me up like Simba out of the Lion King? I think, well, one, he probably would have crushed all my ribs as he lifted me up. And it's just, it's one of those fabulous moments that you just, you just can't help but laughing at and just go, there's sometimes in refereeing, you just go, thank Christ that didn't happen in my game. You know, you'd love to see it happen, but you don't want to see it happen in your game. Sure. So certainly I've never, I've seen some bits like it. Um, uh, I remember I was talking to somebody the other day about there was a game in sale and I was, I was just there watching it. Um, I had a premiership game the next day and I was sitting behind Kingsley Jones, who was coaching sale at the time. And the referee, David Rose, was kind of getting a little bit in the way in the first half. And there was a Welsh centre there, a bit of a lunatic fella, great guy called Lee Thomas, pretty tough guy. And he said to Lee, look, you need to deal with the referee, get him out of your channel, you know, so you want to make the tackles. So when whoever they were playing, Gloucester, whoever it was, made a break up the pitch, he just ran beside the referee. And as the referee got to the breakdown, he just shoved him out of the way as they were arriving in the breakdown. Didn't even give him a chance to get in trouble which reminded me of Victor Kaleshi. Is it Kaleshi from the Georgian Claremont winger, or uh, uh, wing forward, who Wayne Barnes was standing in his way and he just ran out of the line and pushed Wayne and went back into the line. Yeah, I do remember it, that one. It's just moments of madness. Um, I have a terrible reputation for just getting absolutely steamrolled by players <laughs> who I get in the way of. I believe in Apollo did it to me at, um, in um, Olympic Park in a Quinns game. I just got absolutely killed. Uh, the Claremont winger got caught on an inside. The, the worst one is an inside ball on a line out when the scrum half passes off the top to the scrum half back in. And I got Damien Pinot absolutely flattened me. And the only thing I could think about doing was um, picking him up and asking him if he was all right. Was he injured? Did he need help? As I was trying to find my ribs. So I, I lifted him up and went, uh, Ça va, ça va bien? Et tu blessé? <laughs> and see, you know, try and deflect like that as I was trying to, you know, how many ribs have I got left? Oh, does it hurt though? Because we've got the adrenaline running through our body. Yeah. Does it, it hurt does, you? It, it does because you don't see it coming. You know, yeah, it, it, that's it. it. Whiplash. It's a lie. If I saw it coming, I'd get killed. But it hurts a bit more when you don't see it coming. Yeah. You just hope if someone's going to run to you, it's going to be Christian Wade or Dan Robson or, you know, you just hope that. You know, or Zebo before he went to France when he was a young monster <laughs> winger, he, you know, a bit slimmer. Uh, yeah, them French baguettes will get you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, JP, you've refereed hundreds of top flight matches over the years. So what are the weirdest encounters that you've witnessed as a referee? It, it's, it's not a lot of the stuff is in around the pitch or off pitch. Um, doing games in France, um, on a Thursday night at 9.30 in a pro D2 match, a bit like the video says, anything can happen. It's the wild west. The premiership, everything's a bit more online. W one thing that kind of a referee world will show you what happens is, I was doing a game, Ryan played, it was a, a European Cup game, Montpellier, Glasgow. And I did a game there and the, uh, the Montpellier 10, uh, I can't remember, it wasn't, I think, yeah, it was um, uh, the, the 10 they had there for a long time, Tranduk, isn't it? He ran forward and did a deliberate knock on um, from a Glasgow backline pass. And Glasgow boys were, oh, that should be. Uh... So I gave a penalty and I didn't give it a yellow because it wasn't a line break and it wasn't this, it wasn't that. Afterwards, they have this beautiful spread of food upstairs. Uh, Murat Altred does lovely food upstairs. Um, and I'm, I'm tucking into some decent, decent food after the game. And Mr. Altrad comes and sits beside me and he's kind of yelling at me in French. What were you doing? How, how was that a penalty against my player? You know, this is crazy. Um, and I'm trying to work out the translations in my head. And Gregor Townshend comes and sits on the other side to me to talk to me about the same incident. That's crazy. How could you not give a yellow card? What are you even doing here? I'm going, hold on, you think I'm crap because I gave a penalty 
and you think I'm crap because I didn't give a yellow card. I don't know what I'm meant to do here. So I just kind of left them, backed out, backed a bit, and they just had an argument together. Mr. Altrad in French and Gregor in Scott, Scottish. And I was just able to eventually just keep walking back towards the door and left and just left them to it. But that's kind of the life as a referee. I've never been picked up and thrown around. I've got bundled in to celebrations. When teams yeah. score, they'll deliberately bundle you into a celebration and go piley on. Remember Rory Lawson for Gloucester doing that to me once. Uh, he came up behind, grabbed me, and threw me into a celebration. Was like piley on, piley on. I think that's the only one on the pitch, and I couldn't help but laughing. So I ended up kind of jumping up and down in the in the mosh pit. <laughs> that is amazing. What would how would you have reacted to getting lifted up? Yeah. I've, how, would you have, would you have, would you have, Got, giving him a red card because it was it was the way that the opposition team were saying, oh, no, no, you could tell her like that. You can't let him do that. You can't let him I, do that. Give him a red. I, and You know, I'd be lying if I said I knew what I do. To be yeah. honest, I'd be, I'd be absolutely lying. I think I'd be so in shock and I'd be I'd be wetting myself so much because I just know how far a, a Fijian fellow like that could throw me. Jeez. And I'd be thinking, you know, well, I, 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 I guess you need to red card it. In reality, you need to because... What if someone does something next? What if someone gives him a nuggie, puts him in a headlock and gives him a friendly nuggie? You know, where do you draw the line? You, you, you can't lift a referee in the air yeah. like Lion King, you know. <laughs> but, you know, these things happen. I'm not, I, I would hate to think what I would have done. Um, I think you probably have to send them off, but you wish you didn't. Maybe that's yeah, the best. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you could tell as the ref was walking off, it, it, it clicked to him. It was like, hold oh, on a minute, I can't let him get away with that. I've got to go and do something. <laughs> I just, I only wish they did it to one of the senior referees like Nigel or Wayne. Or, That's exactly you know, what we said earlier. Roman, like if you're going to do it, do it to one of the big dogs, you know, that would be, that would make my day. Oh, God. Well, who was the hardest player that you actually found to referee throughout your career? Um, The hardest players are the best players. They're... More and more now, players are disenfranchised, not to, they're disassociated. The referees are all, you know, next job, next job, jobs of work. So it's more the older kind of players who are going out of the game. I guess um, Peter Amani is, is a pretty difficult character. Johnny B, the Irish guys. In Scotland, um, Greg Laidlaw was probably the hardest guy I had to deal with. Um, that's because he's always on the losing side. So. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I, remember I did a game. I did a game at Gloucester. And, you know, he hasn't got the teeth in. And he's such a good guy. And he's such an bright guy and a good captain. And he comes up and he's so, such got that Borders accent that can be quite tough to understand when they got the gum shield in. So he had the gum shield in. He came up to me during a game. And it was about four penalties into the second half. And they were all against Gloucester. And they were all simple stuff like, not rolling away or offside, nothing. They just happened to be penalties. And he came up and he said, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, sorry, Greg, what, what, what do you want me to look at? Hey, nee, nee, nee. I'm like, it's good. I, can you take out your gum shield? I'm so sorry. I, I, I really do apologize. Uh, I can't understand what you're saying. So he took out the gum shield and said it again, but he'd no, not that many teeth in. And he went, hey, and he, something us. And I was like, oh, he means I'm not doing very nice things to them. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, no worries, Gregor. Uh, Greg, I'll have a look at that uh, in the next 10 minutes. And after the game, he was all nice and done up after the game, and they, they won or whatever it was. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, I said you're completely in us to the whole game. I was like, ah, that's what you were saying. Sorry, I didn't. So Gregor was always, or sorry, Greg was always a, a real tough guy to deal with. But, you know, often the tough guys are the guys you want to deal with. Rory Cockett's another guy from Cast who can be, quite tricky um and yes yeah yeah it's normally the scrum halves yeah, sergio, so I was gonna say the nines it's always the nines, Ser sergio it? is pretty pretty difficult as well you know those sorts of guys what about some of the players who just like would refuse to shut up on the pitch um so the sergio, sergio yeah. Bruce comes in yeah Ser sergio would be would be pretty difficult you know generally the scrum halves are 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 the most verbose and difficult uh, in the Premiership. You got you got quite a lot of different nationality scrum halves in there that they can be they can be quite difficult. I think Connor Murray is quite a, a tricky guy. You know when things don't slide his way, he can let you know pretty quickly that he's he's not that happy with you. But then he'll do something. You know 
his skill level dictates and everything's okay in the world again. Ooh. So he can be in Ireland. He can be quite difficult. I think Simon even could probably attest to that. Yeah, yeah, um, who else would be, who else would be really tricky? Uh, Nick Easter from Harlequins was always a, a real tough guy to deal with. Um, a lot of the players that are difficult are very bright and very talented and they know what they're doing and they know how to put you under pressure. I also think it's the ones that, like you said, are very intelligent that, we always had Tim Swinson who wanted to be a referee so he knew the rules inside out I'll be honest half the time I'm like I'm not sure whether what's what the rules are there he knew every rule inside out so if the refs were making a he would go up and try and explain to him why that rule why they were wrong and yeah and you just like Swinno shut up just get a lot and a lot of time they can be right they've seen something you haven't a lot of the time they're right. Like if Connor, say Connor, for example, is looking at the breakdown, he knows what a good breakdown looks like and what a bad breakdown looks like. And he knows if he can't get the ball away next time, what that means for his back line or, you know, a full back hitting the line and the timing's out. And he, he gets upset about that. Or the scrum half gets upset. A lot of the time when they're being tough, there's an element or more than an element of truth in there. So that's the game. We, it's, rugby is a really grey game. Because you could look at a breakdown and say one thing, Simon, you'll say something completely different because either you're not that visual in on it or you just don't care because you're at, you're standing out here and just get me the ball. I don't care what happens over there. But Ryan, your whole game's based around how quickly what did your pack win the ball, scrum half, how quickly they moved it. So people have different opinion based on where they look. All the defense want to do is slow the ball and all the attack want to do is have fast ball. And those two things can't meet together at the same time. And that's what's, that's why rugby's grey. You know, it doesn't have, like soccer has, we put VAR in, this is offside, this isn't offside, this is handball, this isn't handball. We can't do that in rugby. It's opinionated. But what you're saying is the majority of people that moaned the most were coming from Munster is what I sort of picked up there. <laughs> that's, I've always kind of believed that. Yeah. But no, no, they're really good. I, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, the Irish team, that's probably the one I refereed the most uh, in Ireland. And certainly I, I've seen them have some, some massive battles and some very, very big games. And they're a hell of a team. They're a hell of a team to referee, but they, they've got some bright characters in there as well. Mm. Donica yeah. Ryan being another, being another one, I guess. Yeah. 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 Very, very smart. Yeah. yeah. He, <laughs> like Johnny Sexton himself, he can give the old death stare to the ref if it doesn't go his way. But yeah, he, but he, it, he, it, it, it's very rare. You get a death stare for no reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, JP, I suppose this weekend alone, we saw three occurrences in which players were guilty of swearing at or questioning the referee's decision. Do you think that the players' respect for referees has kind of gotten worse over the years? No, 100% not. I think it's far, far, far better than it ever was. I think players are brilliant. I think they take everything on the chin. I think a good example is you've had three, three players do three things, right, out of whatever, 20 games this weekend, 4,000 breakdowns, whatever it is. So if you had, if you had 20 classes of, of pupils, I'm a school teacher, if you had 20 classes of pupils and three pupils misbehaved in those 20 classes, would you say the school has a teacher respect problem? No, you're going to get incidents. There's always a backstory to the incident as well. I think you have to examine the reason why. I, we're not having players going up being abusive to referees. There was a player who used an expletive with a referee. There was a player who was a bit silly after he was sent off, saying something out of frustration. It's not abuse towards the referee. It's just bad comments. Yeah, we were saying earlier, it's, it's just uh, with COVID at the moment, you hear a lot more over that ref mic, don't you? With no fans yeah. there, with yeah. the, you know, the quality of mics that you guys wear. So I think a lot of people and the press can jump on stuff like that because they pick it up on the TV now. So you hear a lot of stuff on the field, which would have gone on for the last few years anyway, but you hear it getting shouted yeah. out. So people can pick up on that a lot more, can't they? There is an awful lot of swearing on a rugby pitch. <laughs> there is an awful lot of swearing, but sometimes, and normally it's play, there's a lot more swearing between players than there is anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But never really directed at you guys. No. You know what I mean? Like no. that, like if, like in whatever teams that I had been involved in in the past, if, if you had done something like that, to a referee like you're letting the team down like you know you're 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 going to make it our jobs a lot harder for the rest of the game and then the next time you come back to ref there's just certain things like that we would have been told that's an absolute no-no 
Like you don't play the next week if if you're effing out the referee during a game, you know. So uh, from what my experiences would have been coming through certain teams playing with the likes of Paul O'Connells and, and Ronald O'Gars, these senior guys who let you know what's acceptable and what's not. I would have said that that would have been completely unacceptable, but that's just different strokes for different folks, I guess. But you being the main man in the hot seat know a lot more than I do. But I suppose you're right with what you said with with regards to, uh, you know, the the three students in a class of 20 classes. So um, I understand you, but if it was on my team, I'd still be incredibly disappointed by you. Sometimes I do look at refs and I just think you guys would make awesome teachers because you, you kind of are just dealing with grown men they're grown children in men's bodies and you're just able to control them really well. So yeah. It's, it's more like teaching year three or four, not because the players behave like that, that, that. Please don't take that similarly. But what it is, is players get frustrated when they're not being listened to, when, the, when, they're, when their point of view isn't being absorbed. And maybe you guys can come in and say this after me. Like, so if a referee is constantly telling them, no, 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 away, 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 like you would do with a seven, eight-year-old, the, the, the madness and the frustration builds up in them and then reasoning goes out the window. That's why they don't behave like seven, eight-year-olds, but if you treat them like that, you'll get the same reaction as you would from that age group. That's why it's kind of like primary school. Men. That is, is so true. And I spoke about it before, and like when some of these dive matches, when you get the referee that goes, don't talk to me, don't talk to me, and walks away, or you're talking to them and just ignores you, Makes it gets you angry. You get like, oh, hold on a minute. It, well, there's no, why is there no conversation here? We brought up Nigel like a lot in this podcast and said, like, the way he would speak with players and, you know, the conversations you have, even on the move, like moving from, you know, a penalty kick to the corner as we're moving, having those discussions are so important, especially for captains. And it's when, yeah, when you get the referee that says, don't want to hear it, don't talk to me. And there will be times where they do it and you, you understand why they're doing it. Speak to me at the next point. But, yeah, that's uh, that's so true. Like exactly what you. you yeah, know, so I, I have a rule. If I push a player away, I make sure I go find him at the next breakdown because I often I push him away because it's the other team's penalty because that's the nature of. That's why you want to speak to him. We've given away a penalty, but you actually have to go back, which is infuriating for you know from a psychological point of view. But if there will be an injury within the next two minutes, there will be a scrum, there will be a line out. Even if he's the full back, I tell you, I can go find him and go. Yeah. Do you want to talk to me about that thing? Are you still mad? And I've had players say, no, no, I'm still mad. I'll talk to you in two minutes. I'm like, yeah, cool. Come find me when you when you're drop the red mist. No. So uh, Johnny would be a good example. Uh, Owen Farrell, very good, was used to find it very difficult with referees and has improved off the scale of how he now can deal with referees. He put a lot of work in. But it's not about manipulating. It's about getting the best for your team. And because referees... No one cares about referees. No one should care about referees. You're irrelevant. Do your job, make it a game, go home. I've also now, I've also been told you've had some bust up with coaches over the years. Which one can you remember was maybe your biggest yes. bust up? <laughs> uh, no, it's, you, you always have bust up with coaches and I'm probably a bit too verbose for my own good sometimes that I would stand up for myself and I love an argument. So I'd be very happy whether it's, one of the Laurents in my dressing room after the game in France, because you come in and there's nothing sure than uh, Laurent Travers. Travers is the beat with oh. hair, Travers without, isn't it? Travers is no hair, yeah. Yeah, he would it. be in your, he was sitting on my bag one day after I did a game in cast in my dressing room, shouting at me in French. I just had to, I don't speak a word of French. I'm sorry, I don't speak French. <laughs> and the lads went, do you speak French? I'm like, yeah, but he doesn't need to know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> There was always, you know, you're always your Conor O'Shea's at Harlequins or, you know, Gregor could be quite difficult. It, it depends if you had a losing streak with a coach. They would see you, you arrive, they lose. Next week you come, they lose. And if you didn't, I always felt some teams, my, my, my style of refereeing suited more rather than some other teams, if that makes sense. So teams who played in a certain style my refereeing worked more for them. I remember Munster playing a game uh, at Edinburgh, which they lost. It was a European Cup game. Some you might have played. Yeah. And Munster just couldn't click with the way I was refereeing, and Edinburgh could. And yeah. Paul was chatting to me throughout the game, and there was no problem with the relationship, but just Munster couldn't get what I was trying to do, and Edinburgh could. And that can lead 
to frustration sometimes. I think the game ended with Paul O'Connell giving away a chop tackle penalty mm. because he'd been allowed to do it for three weeks. And I said to him for the game, you're not allowed to do that. And then he gave a penalty away and lost the game. And sometimes those things can lead to frustrations with coaches. But yeah, I'd always, always stick up for myself, maybe a bit too much. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Spot I'd say on. that's a good thing. Absolutely. But in, in terms of, I suppose, decision-making on the field throughout your career, what's been maybe the most difficult decision you've ever had to make? Uh, diff- well, I, both, yeah, I think that they're easy for me to answer because both the premiership games I did went down to extra time and went down to the last kick of the game. Um, so the, the, the Saracens, I, I did Saracens versus Northampton in uh, 2014, and that went to a try under the post on the last play of the game to win the game. And then Wasp versus, Wasp versus Exeter went to, the la- went to the last play of 80 minutes and Nathan Hughes gave away a penalty. I think that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do to blow a whistle because he thought he was doing the right thing, but it was tech- he gave away a technical penalty. And I was like, I screamed at him before he did it. I was like, I screamed as hard as I could at him to not get him to do it. And he did it, gave away the penalty, went extra time. And then it was won in the last second by a scrum penalty. Pretty easy. But it, it was those decisions. When, you, when your whistle decides a game, they're the, they stick with you forever. You're never, even if they're right, if they're wrong, it's worse. But even if they're right, it sticks with you far, far longer. And I think any decisions I made around end of game where it was a penalty, I can remember every every game I ever did where a penalty decided a game because ultimately, I don't mind if it's a stupid penalty that the player gives away, a foul play penalty or something, because I just think that's your fault. So yeah. example, the Paul O'Connell Munster one, that was Paul's, in a way, that was Paul's fault, so I didn't feel so bad. But if a player thought that it wasn't a rook and he was allowed to pick it up or he wasn't allowed to pick it up, those technical penalties, which you have to give because that's your role there, they're very difficult for the player to stomach. And you then can feel that emotion. You should feel that emotion. And you should feel something there as well. So those games I always remember. I, you know, I, I, was, I played a game at, at golf with Ian Keatley not so long ago. And we talked about that, 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 that semi-final with Munster in Paris and just that first 20 minutes and a couple of things went against him in that first 20 and talking about that. And I could remember every incident as clearly as he could. So it shows that symbiotic relationship. You do remember, you don't just do the game, walk away and never think about it. Yeah. Think about everything. Red cards are easy because the player deserved it. Otherwise you shouldn't red card him. But those small technical, small decisions are far, far harder. Well, JP, I know we won't keep you for much longer, but um, I suppose I just wanted to kind of chat about the fact that after maybe 12, what was it, after 12 years refereeing in the Premiership, um, you stepped away from that in August. So (laughs) in the nicest way, yeah, I'm trying to be really nice about it, but how did that come about? um, And what were maybe the reasons the ORFU kind of gave you? Uh, Well, I I didn't actually ask in the end. I just kind of got the news and went fine. (laughs) Um, It just, I, you know, the easiest thing is they just made redundancies. They decided I was the best person to make redundant. And that's, you know, players move clubs, people move jobs. It's not ideal. I wasn't happy. I didn't like it. I was upset. But I understood their point where things are. It's a game. We move on. I, I, there isn't, a, if there was a story, it'd be great to get it out there and say, well, what they did and what I did. It's a situation they were in. They made a decision. Sucks for me. I'm sure it sucks for them as well. And you just, you move on. There's no chapter seven of the book that you could say, well, I'll hold this one back. It just, it just is a redundancy. And there's a lot of people in a lot of situations at the moment. And, you know, no one's going to cry for a referee, unfortunately. You're a fantastic referee. And every time we've got to, to have you as a ref, I've loved it so Nothing but great things to say about you, Jay. Zeebs must know something I don't. Is he going to, is he going to the top 14 or something? Is that one? <laughs> yeah, come to the top 14. Right in there already, Zeebs. I get you. He's French, lads. He can get a, he can get a top 14 rep. There's, <laughs> there's quality reps needed in the top 14. <laughs> no, on that note, JP, we will let you go. I won't keep you any longer. Um, okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we wish you all the best for the future. And no the kids. Worries. Anytime. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Happy, Thanks. Happy, Thanks. Happy, Thanks. New Happy New Year. See you back in the year. Soon. Um, no, Zeebs, so you were meant to be playing against La Rochelle uh, this week, a team coached by your friend Roland Agar, but obviously, sadly, the game was postponed. 
Well, I want to know, what are your memories of Ronan as a player? Uh, I had some great memories playing with Ronan, um, with Raj. Um, we had a really good connection, you know, funnily enough. He, he took a, a liking to me as a young fellow when I was 18 or 19, coming, coming through, getting to train with the, with the senior team. And then not shortly after, I was, you know, playing with him week in, week out. And uh, it was fantastic. It was not too dissimilar to the sort of on-field relationship I have with uh, Finn Russell now at Racing. You know, he's the type of player who's so intelligent and backs the players outside him. Like, you, you you, give him one call and he'll do it, you know. So I remember scoring a lot of tries off of Ronan and, you know, um, a lot of good things would happen generally when we were uh, around the pitch together. So, like, it was it was uh, an amazing couple of years. I wish it lasted longer, you know. He was obviously one of my childhood heroes growing up and, and, and he's still a hero of mine. Um to this day, but uh, to have gotten to play with him was incredibly special. You know, some some great away victories and and some some huge games in Thomond Park that will, uh, yeah, stay fondly with me and live long in the memory. What was that? You're you just a smart said... man, by the way, Zeebs. Like I've, I've I've worked out what you do. It's like you're the winger that gets in with the ten. Hey, Finn. Let's... Yes. Because <laughs> Finn Finn's looking to that wing where you're on. He's going. I'm going to smack this across the field to Zeebs because I like it. <laughs> Whereas he looks at the other one, he's like, oh, "I'll keep on with this." I'll exactly. Just keep it back on the inside. Unbelievable. Very smart yeah, yeah. man. Very smart man. That's the. That's it's the number ten who has to get me the ball, so I have to be nice. You yeah, know. Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> but Zebra, you just mentioned there that like Ronan was a, a childhood hero of yours, and then you kind of you got to play with him when you went into Munster. So how like how was that? Do you feel like your your the start of your career was um how am I going to put this? Starstruck. Yeah, were you a little bit starstruck or do you feel like, you know, because Ronan took a shine to you, maybe your transition into the professional or the or the senior squad was a little bit easier or? Yeah, yeah, I definitely, yeah. Um, I was always starstruck. <laughs> Funny thing is, even though he's my mate, sometimes when I see him, I still get starstruck. I'm like, that's Raj, like, you know, I, I have to pinch myself sometimes to, you know, he's a he's a buddy of mine now, like, and... Uh, but yeah, for sure. When I was coming through from the early days, he he um, he just you know bestowed a lot of confidence in me, and and uh, I was already confident. But you know, he really made me believe that I could be, uh, you know, playing, you know, week in week out with Munster, playing for Ireland, giving the lines a crack, all these things. And you know, uh, for a young lad in his teens, that was that was huge. You know, especially coming from somebody like that. So. Um, I've nothing but great memories and uh, and things like that with Ronan and, and yeah he he definitely helped me hugely when I was uh, coming through because a lot of it when you're a young player coming through is confidence um, uh, yeah so he he definitely backed me and uh, I love playing with him yeah. In your eyes, which moment stands out as Ronan's greatest? Oh, there's too many. It's it's ridiculous. His highlight reel is a joke. You know he's the most he's the most I don't know if the term's used a lot in, in rugby, but he's the most clutch player, you know, like, so uh, if there's ever a pressure moment, he is by far the most, um, the best performer under pressure I've ever seen in my life. Um, any kick or any pass or any kick to the corner or any, you know, anything that you you need something to happen in a big, big game, Raj could could do it on his own, you know, irrelevant to the team that was around him. If he had like a pack of eight forwards and nobody out the back, he'll win the game for you. You know, if the game is big enough, you know, I, I've never seen a player perform so well under pressure in my life. Um, you've seen all the drop goals, like the Northampton, the cast, the Six Nations, Grand Slam drop goal. There's the list goes on and on. Like, But to get to those situations, he's had umpteen more pressure situations to even get to those famous ones. So. Um, I have never seen a player with more mental strength under pressure than him. So yeah, I, I couldn't speak higher of him. Yeah, he's an incredible player. There's not one memory, sorry, I'm now that sticks out. There's there's literally too many. What do you make of the rumours that Israel Folau is making a comeback to rugby and heading to Toulon? Go on, Zeebs. Let you say this one. <laughs> you know, uh, Zeebs, would you be up for sharing the field with him after all of the deeply homophobic comments he's made? Well, not on the same team. Definitely not. No, but you share a field. If well, if he if he's playing opposite me, yeah, there's nothing I can do. You know, I wouldn't let my team down by not playing. But um, 
I uh, yeah, I have no time for that. No time for any of his thoughts or, or things like that. Um, I think it's unbelievably backwards type of mentality. I think, um, yeah, I think it's such a shame. Like such a such a talented guy, like really really good player. But um, you know, I I personally, this is just what I think now. A lot of people might think differently, but I'd have a serious issue with that. Um, you know, there's racism, there's homophobia. Like they, these are things that I hold on the same playing field. Like you know, and if I have, I have three kids now, and if all three of them decided to be gay when they grow up. Me and him are going to have like serious issues, you know, because they probably having a father who plays rugby, they'll know about Israel for now. And they'll see all these things, you know, the way social media is in this day and age. And they like what it could do to, to people internally, how it can brainwash them into, you know, these negative things, you know, basically saying you're going to hell if you're gay and all this stuff. I, I have no time for it. And I think it does way more harm than any good that he kind of sees that he's trying to do. I think, you know, um, there's too many people out there that uh, have issues with coming out and all these things. And there's people in our game, like Nigel Owens, who would be way more, um, I suppose, way more of a global figure to our game than uh, someone like Israel Falou, you know. So I'd 100% be, you know, not against him playing, you know, like he's able to do whatever he can do. You know, he probably has most to feed, but, um, you know, for Toulon and these clubs to be linked with him, it's not a good look for those clubs either because they're kind of endorsing his beliefs then by saying, oh, come play with us, you know, share change rooms with these guys. And what if one of those guys, you know, is gay or have gay children or X, Y, and Z? I just, I've no time for him whatsoever. I don't know him personally, but if you're spreading that kind of hate on the internet the whole time, I have no time for you. That's Ryan, what about you? What do you Catalan, think about this? Catalan Dragons have sort of made it okay, haven't they? They've like, because mm. when was it? 2019? What are we in now? 2021, bloody hell. But 2019, and Catalan Dragons signed him. I, like, they've almost made it okay. And you've got teams now going, you've got Toulon and Montpellier going, well, if he's playing for them, why can't he play for us? But mm. no, exactly the same. Like, I love the thing with Catalan Dragons going to play someone Manchester way. I don't really follow too much of the league stuff. And did you see they turned their uh, stadium into like a pride festival? Oh, go away, <laughs> did they? Brilliant. I didn't see that. <laughs> they found out that he was coming to play and like they, I mean, there was uproar in the, uh, in the league stuff in, in their league. And I know that that, yeah, one of the Manchester sides, I can't remember, Huddersfield or someone like that. They said, we're going to have a pride festival for when he comes, which I think, how good is that? Like, that's amazing. Yeah. But that's the problem. They've made it okay. And it's not, is it? And it's not okay. And like you said, you put it on the same level as racism because yeah, it, yeah. It, it, that's what it is. Like, Oh, man. And I just think it's worse for people, like the younger generation who will grow up through social media, who will idolise this guy back, you know, everywhere. Like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. But you, imagine being a teenager or what and struggling mentally to decide oh, can I come out to my friends? And, you know, you have other friends who idolise him and they're like, oh, is he this, is he that? And your man's just showing all this hate and saying, you're going to hell, you need to repent for all your sins. And they're like, this is who I am. Like, I'm a bad... And then, you know, it filters, I'm a bad person. What am I doing? You know, that's... There's a lot darker stuff happens, I think, as a result of what he's doing. And I have zero time for him, zero tons for him. I wouldn't shake his hand, to be honest. I... I I get, I get angry when I think about these things. Uh, I hold that at the same level as racism, so uh, zero time for it. So hopefully it's a Lions summer coming up. So we're building a great team of tourists, so fantastic men to hang out with, who live spirits, and our barroom heroes. Already in the 15 are Chris Ashton at 11, James Denny in the centre, Matt Tualu at Scrum Half, props Dave Kilcoyne and John Welsh, and Andy Powell in the back row alongside Neil Best. So guys, I need one more player from each of you and a story as to why you've chosen them. So Zebo, I'll start with you. <laughs> I, I'll, put, <laughs> I'll put my my good mate, White Chappie, Finn Russell in there at number 10. Um, just because he is a great man on the beers. Uh, Ryan, you'll know yourself. Um, a little story. Um, me having three kids don't get to go out as much as I used to but uh, one of the first games we had with Racing um, it was away to Toulon and we won I think it was actually our first competitive game together and we won and um, 
like uh, <laughs> the boys went back to the hotel and it was quite you know it was quite calm but like we had a few beers in the change room nothing major but um we got to the hotel and we were all sitting around having another quiet beer and Finn was probably just a little level ahead of everyone else and started the dance move started to come out a little bit early and I was like oh okay this guy is gonna be this guy's gonna be good crack these uh and um the president was sat down he went over started to dance with the president well around the president and then I was talking to the head coach Finn comes over and you know it gives like uh, do you remember LeBlanc the center back for the French team used to kiss Fabian Barthez's bald head like when they'd win a game or something or when he'd make a big save Got, <laughs> he got Laurent Travers' head and just gave it a big kiss and a lick. <laughs> and I swear, oh. I couldn't believe it. It was very, very funny. Um, you can get away with that when you're the superstar, though, eh? Yeah, you, uh, but Toto or Laurent Travers is great fun and um, we were all in a great mood. That's a tough place to go, so... We were all having the fun and we were testing the boundaries and it turned out to a, turned out well. So it was a good laugh. And he did exactly as Santa Gregor Townsend kissed him and licked did him. He? Off. <laughs> ah, did he? <laughs> 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 no That's chance. Finn, Finn is definitely up there. He has he I'd have him captain on this team for sure. He's a, he's a champion. Yeah, I feel like this this team, it's like I'm I'm kind of beginning to question how much rugby would actually be played with this squad that we're putting together. Oh, well, we need to play rugby. I thought it was just for the piss. Yeah, I can't <laughs> no, Ryan, do you but, have any stories about Finn? None really that I can tell. Um <laughs> only when I've probably retired or given in the Scotland stuff. <laughs> Completely given up hope <laughs> for the Scotland stuff. But um so but one thing I know about Finn is He's obviously on a different pay packet to the rest of us at Scotland. So oh, that's, for, that's for sure. When we go out, there is some serious panic when Finn starts ordering the, ordering the bottles of Dom Perignon, etc. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa Finn, because we usually try and split the bill at the end of the night. Yeah. You know, there's a serious panic when he's up there giving it the big one. But you know, he's an incredible man. I love him. Absolutely. Yeah. He's even better on the piss. Unreal. Yeah. Hey guys, just wanted to um, do one thing before we go. I'm wearing this lovely snood here for Team Glasgow. It's for the My Name's Doddy Foundation. They're doing the Doddy Gump, which uh, basically you need to get out and do a little bit of exercise, whether you're running, swimming, doing whatever you want. I'm going to be running around on a rugby pitch if it's not frozen. Um, you can do- download Track for Good app to chuck your miles in there. And you just need to make a donation and you'll get your own team snood. So get over there. It's for MND um, and it's a brilliant cause. And I know that it ends on the 6th of Feb. So get on and do it as soon as possible. Cheers. Awesome. Well, that's it from us. Thanks to JP Doyle, Ryan Wilson and Simon Zebo, And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast so you get it as soon as it's released. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks,